fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCB 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. We're going to talk about uh, Custer. And uh, we've got a guy, he's a returning guest. He's uh, been on before for Butch Cassidy. And uh, he's written, I believe, five books on uh, Custer. We'll find out. So, Tom Hatch, thank you for being here. Well, thanks for having me back, Al. I enjoyed it before, and let's hope I enjoy it again. Well, I'll tell you what. Um, <laughs> I, I, we had a great time, and, and it, it was a good show. And uh, on our rerun week, I actually found it, and I said, well, hey, play that. So in L.A., they played a rerun week. And after your show aired, uh, the owner of the station actually messaged me and said uh, that he really liked the show, and and he really liked uh, you as a guest and the the whole thing. So I thought, well, we need to have him back on. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I I appreciate that. I, uh, you know, I... I just try to relate what I have in the book. I'm a writer and, and not really a lecturer anymore. And uh, uh, sometimes I, I think like a writer and I want to edit a little bit after I say it. So yeah. if, I, <laughs> if I say something uh, stupid, just, you know, let me know that it's stupid and I'll, uh, I'll yeah. think up something else plausible. All right? That's all right. We do it all the time. <laughs> uh, you know, it, but it's no, it's good. Um, I think it's great, uh, that, and it was it really surprised me. Not that I, because I think it's a great show, I, and I love doing the western shows or stuff like this. And um, it, it just, just surprised, surprised me. you that we got a positive email. Yeah, for 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 a show uh, like a western show like this, a history show uh, out of L.A. Um, you know, I just it just did. I thought they that would just kind of play and it would be fine. But that, so I'm thinking. Well, there's, there's- I was just going to say, to tell you the truth, there's been several production companies out of L.A. over the past year since that book was released that have uh, discussed uh, an option on it for uh, either a movie or a TV series. And nothing has come of it yet, but uh, there's been stuff working. And uh, at one point, there was a company associated with Steven Spielberg that was interested that Supposedly, Spielberg himself had, re- had read the book and uh, and signed off on it, but I'm mm-hmm. still poor, so oh, yeah. they, <laughs> they haven't bought it yet. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, I think that just comes as being a writer. Um, but, uh, yeah, but I think that's great. I I I would be so interested in that. Um, they just don't have enough. I think a series on Netflix or one of those channels uh, in in the Western mode about these old. Uh, Stories. I think that would be fascinating because that's something that you don't see a lot of. Yeah, if they were true stories, I yeah. I do get people occasionally. I've been on documentaries on PBS, uh, which did a documentary on the Last Outlaws. Also, I've been on documentaries on PBS and History Channel and Discovery Channel. Uh, uh, recently, a three-part uh, Western history show. Uh, with Sir Tony uh, Richardson or Robertson from uh, England, <laughs> yeah. and uh, uh, that that was interesting. But sometimes they don't re- they have a perception of something and they don't get the facts down. Yeah. And uh, some the facts actually are more fascinating than some of this uh, bunkum that they make up. So uh, that's the same thing. Of, you know, we're talking about Custer today and. Custer is probably the most misunderstood person in history, the most maligned person in history, and e- even you know you have your uh, your people from the South. Even people from the South respected Custer. Uh, his best friends at West Point, for example, were Southerners. He roomed with Southerners, and he mm-hmm. did many acts of kindness during the Civil War towards his Southern enemies. He even stood as groomsman at a at a wedding. 
for a prisoner of war that had been his buddy at West Point. And he, others, he, he took off the battlefield and went to, uh, uh, took them to a, uh, his personal doctor and to try and get them treated. And, and, uh, when the war was basically over and they were at Appomattox and they had all these prisoners, Custer had his regimental band play Dixie for them. And he dropped out of a tour of, 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 uh, reconstruction because he thought it was offensive to the South. And, uh, so, you know, it's very interesting to see, uh, a guy who was the class clown at West Point become one of the biggest heroes of the Civil War and, and not get any credit for it. Well, and that's basically because he was, he's remembered for one day in his life. Yeah, the I day was going to say. Died. Yeah. Yeah, the, so. the, the Custer Last Stand seemed to be what stayed with him. Nothing else. Because yeah. if you talk yeah. to anybody, that's all they know him for. Um, that's all anybody. And they don't him. even know the truth about that. That's what makes me mad. They don't. They they think Custer made a blunder. They think Custer did this. The thing about it is his his battle plan was beautiful. It should have, would have, could have worked if people would have carried it out. But they didn't carry out his battle plan, and that left him trapped and and in trouble. Uh, and I mean, I was a Marine in Vietnam. I know what it is to hear a shot fired in anger. I know what it is to go out on a patrol, and you do your portion of the patrol and hope the other people do their job. And you don't know what they're doing, but if you do yours, you'll come back okay. And that didn't happen at Little Bighorn. And that's another story, another mystery that I solved in my book called The Last Days of George Armstrong Custer. But... They don't understand Custer because there's been very little written about his Civil War exploits. And so that's why I wrote the book Glorious War. Uh, it's just, I started researching Custer decades ago, and I was amazed. I couldn't believe this stuff. And why isn't it known? Why isn't it in history books? And it was basically because of the prejudice towards him. They, they put him as the uh, as the poster boy for the destruction of Indian culture, which wasn't true. He had great respect for the for the Native Americans. He even said that you know if I was an Indian, I wouldn't stay on that lousy reservation with all the ills of white civilization. I'd be gone. I'd be out there trying to live on my own. I mean, he but he was a soldier. He did his job as a soldier and. That's what people don't understand. That in the military, if you're given an order, you do it. <laughs> Simple as that. You don't say, well, I don't know. They're shooting at me, so I think I'll turn right here. No, you go straight. <laughs> That's what your orders say. Well, there's a few and, that do that. but uh, <laughs> As much as it sucks, you've got to move forward. Yeah. yeah. Well, see, that, that's my, been my contention about some of these professors and historians that you know, think they know what happened in some battle or something. You can't reconstruct it in a classroom or a video game or even hearing testimony. You've got to be out there like I was and be scared to death when they're shooting at you to know how these troops react under fire because they're no different in the Civil War or Little Big Horn or my days in Vietnam or World War II. They're no different. We we act the same way. We were scared to death, but we did our job we, that we were trained to do. I mean, the Civil War, you know, talk about an unbelievable time in history where, you know, I guess they agree now that there was about 800,000 men killed in that war. If you look at it today's terms of population, that would be like 10 million killed in today. That affects a lot of families. And then all of the civilians that died, all of the the infrastructure that was uh, the railroad tracks and the, and the businesses, plantations. I mean, things that were destroyed. What an unbelievable war. We can't we can't even imagine that war. But one thing we know, Custer came out of it as one of the greatest heroes in America, and that is what made Little Bighorn important. Right, right, because they they expected him to win at everything. Once once we have someone like that, um, we they just can't lose, right? I mean, we could, we can't fathom that. Yeah, 
well, you know, in his day, he wasn't the symbol of defeat. He was the symbol of victory. I mean, because of his amazing achievements, he, he captured the first enemy battle flag taken by the Union Army, which was a big deal, and he accepted the Confederate white flag of surrender at Appomattox. And in between that were events that uh, of, of, of almost unbelievable proportion as he personally led cavalry charges and earned him the admiration of his men and, and the fancy of newspaper reporters and the public loved him. Uh, it, it, it's just such a fascinating story, the rags to riches story. Here he was born on the other side of the tracks to the village smithy and uh, he learned to ride, testing the, the horses that his father would shoe. And uh, he somehow, nobody knows how, he wrangled a, an appointment to West Point, even though his father was a staunch Democrat and the Republican congressman was the one that recommended Custer. Uh, there's a lot of mystery surrounding that. Nobody knows the true story. Some say that the father of a girl that he was dating wanted him out of the picture and got him into West Point, but the, the, the congressman <laughs> and was years <laughs> later when Custer was famous said, well, you know, I saw the potential in the boy and all this, but yeah, he went on to West Point, where he was a class clown. He almost flunked out every semester because of the skins, because of the demerits. I mean, they'd catch him throwing food in the mess hall, throwing snowballs, making loud noises in his sink, hiding food in his chimney. I mean, he was he was a, a wild and fun-loving guy. He was a leader of that class, even though he was basically last in the class. And... uh he got out of West Point and went to uh, uh, the cavalry at Bull Run. As a matter of fact, interesting thing, he reported to uh, General Scott to send him out to the field. Scott said, well, you just got out of West Point. Do you want to go out in the field or do you want to train troops? We can use you to train troops because of West Point. He said, no, I want to get out in the field. So Scott gave him orders to give once he got out in the field, and those orders basically started the battle of Bull Run, the first battle of the Civil War. And in that uh, battle, Custer uh, was uh, cited for bravery. Basically, what he did was broke up a log jam of people at a bridge and got them across and saved some lives and came to the attention of generals that, that said, hey, this guy's a go-getter. So they took him out of the cavalry and put him as a general's aide, and he spent all this time as a general's aide, and, but he did not like staying out in the field uh, with a general back in the rear where he wanted to be up front. So he would go up front occasionally and distinguish himself in various battles, and... Uh, it was just kind of funny because when he captured the first flag, it was at Williamsburg, and uh, in, in May uh, of 1862, he was on the staff of Hancock, General Hancock, and they, the uh, Confederates were facing off with the Union, and the Union uh, guys were supposed to charge, and they wouldn't charge. They were scared to death that they in that charge. So who comes from the rear and, and his horse leaps over the lines and charges right at the Confederates? George Armstrong Custer, the general's aide, took off and the men followed him. And he came back with a battle flag and captured an officer and a few enlisted men and, and uh, came to the attention of people by doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, other things he volunteered for. They, they had a... Uh, uh, a hot air balloon program where they would send a general up in a hot air balloon. And one day the wind blew this general over to Confederate lines where he almost got captured. And they said, well, we need somebody who's expendable. So up goes Custer into the hot air balloon. And he noticed at Yorktown that Lee had, had tricked the Union Army. Lee had set up tents and built campfires, but his, his men had moved out, and Custer noticed that from the air. Then when he got down, he and another man went over there and confirmed that, and that gained him more accolades. He was the kind of guy 
that if they said, Custer, how deep do you think that stream is? Custer jumps in it and finds out how deep that stream is. And uh, uh, this finally came to the attention of uh, the general of the army, McClellan. And he became McClellan's aide. And McClellan trusted him to take words out into the field. Uh, McClellan said Custer always had a clear head. He always had intelligent reports for me. And uh, so th that was an interesting thing about him. He was one of these aggressive type A guys. I knew a guy in the Marine Corps that was like that, and he ended up dying in Vietnam. I guess he made a one-man charge up a hill from what I heard. But there are certain people that, you know, they have this, this uh, inherent trait within them. And they just go and do it, and they don't think about it. I guess they they have instincts, and they they go and do it. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like it. Well, why has he never been featured before? Like, why is it we never hear about this uh, and the type of person he was, and 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 the Civil War? Uh, why is it so so secretive or so quiet? Well, I guess because they again can't break the myth that he was a bumbler at Little Bighorn, which is not true, and that he hated Indians, they've always done this thing, and that he had this a monstrous ego that, you know, hey, you can't talk to me. He was a prankster. He did that all through his career. They, they used to do jokes on their expeditions, you know, telling people to go out and look for for sponge rocks and things like that that didn't <laughs> exist, you know. And, the I mean, original he, he, he was a... a, a a happy-go-lucky guy. I heard something going on. <laughs> <laughs> so, so then, Let, then we we get to him, and and he's in he's in the uh, Civil War, doing doing what he does. Um, how how far did he get in the Civil War? Did he become a general himself? What's interesting about that is he was a lieutenant. He was on the staff of General Pleasanton. Alfred Pleasanton. In May of 1863, uh, uh, he was he was on that staff, and he applied to be a colonel of one of the regiments of the Michigan Calvary, Calvary Brigade. There were three of them, and he uh, was turned down because the Republican governor said, "No, nah, his family's a Democrat, and he's a McClellan man," and they didn't trust McClellan because McClellan was rumored to run against uh, Lincoln in 64 for the presidency, which is what happened, and McClellan lost. But So Custer was a McClellan man, but Custer again went to Brandy Station and, and took over command of, a, of three brigades when, when the colonel was killed there while he was still an aide. And, uh, and at Aldi, he uh, was credited with this daring charge. His horse bolted and carried him right through and around the Confederate lines. And he had to dispatch a couple of cavalrymen, uh, rebel cavalrymen, on his way with, with his sword. And the reporters were there and watched this. And even though he protested he was simply a rider on a runaway horse, they said, no way, you did a one-man charge, and you, you went right into him. And so that was, you know, made public. And then on June 29th, 1863, while all the troops were forming around Gettysburg, unaware that both armies were closing in on Gettysburg, a strange thing happened. On the rec recommendation of General Pleasanton, 23-year-old George Armstrong Custer was unexpectedly promoted to Brigadier General. There were all of these men that were in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s that were captains and majors. And he leapfrogged right over captain, major, lieutenant colonel, colonel, and right into brigadier general. And they gave him all three brigades of the Michigan Cavalry, where he before was not allowed to even have one. And people were absolutely shocked. They couldn't believe it. But Custer stepped into it immediately and, of course, got himself a flamboyant uniform that they used to mock. But all the generals did that. Jeb Stewart on the Confederate general. I wrote a book about him, just a great general. 
he had an ostrich plume in his hat, and I mean, he was he was as flamboyant as it gets. But here's Custer, three days after being a brigadier general, he's at Gettysburg, the Battle of Gettysburg, the turning point of the war, and this is where the mystery starts. And I don't understand it. When I researched this, I had to keep going back and going back and go, why haven't I heard this before? Why isn't this a documentary? Why? And it still isn't to this day. I, I look at documentaries on Gettysburg, and they show Pickett's Charge. You, we're aware of, of Pickett's Charge. Pickett had mm-hmm. 12,000 men, and he, he's going to charge into the into the Union front and break through the Union front. Well, we, we all know what happened. That charge didn't make it across that pasture. He had to go across a pasture, and, and cannons obliterated them, and rifles obliterated them, and most of the most of the men never made it through there. And uh, uh, <laughs> it was it was a, a crazy charge. And why? Why would General Lee, who had won the war up to that point, and he'd won the first two days at Gettysburg, why would he do some crazy charge like that with General Pickett and his men? It was actually Longstreet's charge, but he was a big, bigger general, so they gave the credit of losing it to Pickett. But anyway, Custer was at that battle, but he was not at Gettysburg itself. He was down the road, three, four miles down the road, Later, earlier that uh, the evening of the of July second, Confederate General Jeb Stuart rode in. He had been missing in action. Basically, they couldn't find him. He'd been up uh, wrecking railroad tracks and things like that, and Lee was upset because uh, Stuart was missing. Stuart came in with uh, a gigantic group of men and went right in front of Custer, decided to go up on Crest Ridge with, uh, and uh, had 5,000 cavalry and 1,000 infantrymen that Lee had sent him. And as soon as he got in place on Crest Ridge, he rolled out a cannon, and he blasted four shot, cannon shots, personally directed that. We wonder, well, why did Stuart do that? Okay, well, he was letting Lee know that he was in position. What was he in position for? No one has ever really questioned that. No one has asked about that. But actually, what happened was that uh, Custer was down on the field as the field commander. General David Grigg was was the man in charge down there, and he uh, commanded the 2nd Division. But he was an ambulance general, as they called them. In other words, all these generals were too precious to fight. They had to stay in the rear with the gear. They had to sit back there and then send their aides forward to say, okay, move the second battalion to the right flank, whatever it might be. And, and so Greg turned over, basically turned over the field command to Custer on the field. And so Custer's men are facing Jeb Stewart's men. Jeb Stewart's men were called the Invincibles. They had not lost a battle or a fight or uh, had carried out their mission throughout the war without any uh, opposition from the Union whatsoever. They, I mean, Jeb Stewart was a knight in shining armor, King Arthur down south. Uh, he, and, and maybe he deserved it. He was a brilliant cavalryman if he was... On the uh, Union side, he would have statues built. Uh, well, he he did have statues <laughs> built until they uh, slowed them down. But, are, they, uh, are they still uh, there? Sorry. <laughs> that's, an, that's another story there. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, so Custer is, uh, you know, 23 years old. Uh, the next day, there was a major bombardment. July 3rd, the last day of the battle, a major bombardment as the as the uh, Confederate uh, cannons opened up on on the places uh, where the Union troops were, right at their center, to soften the center. And they figured, okay, there's going to be a charge. And that would become Pickett's charge. But then that was answered by guns from the Union. And then everything went silent. 
and up on Crest Ridge, where Custer was, out on the Hanover Road, Jeb Stewart's men came out of the trees, thousands of them, with their sabers shining in the sunlight. I guess it, it's described where these people were scared. That's the Union, the Union guys. They were highly outnumbered. And so Custer didn't, didn't, uh, really know what was going on and, and Phil Stewart showed his hand right there. And, uh, uh, so Custer told, uh, uh, one of his, uh, one of his battalions to get out there and face these, these rebels that were coming up. And, uh, uh, they did 2,400 of them. And the man that, uh, was out there in charge of them was, uh, an old timer who was basically, uh, tied to his saddle. He was old. He was sick. He was, uh, in real trouble as far as, uh, uh, staying on his horse. <laughs> and so <laughs> instead of, uh, leaving him in charge, Custer himself, uh, this was, uh, Colonel Charles Town, by the way, was that man. And, uh, uh, Custer rode up to town and he said, uh, I will take command. And so Custer rode to the front where everybody in the battalion, all of his people could see him. And he unsheathed his blade and he trotted forward with his customary bravado and watched as his enemy approached down Crest Ridge. And then he, uh, uh, when they had, when the rebels had advanced about a hundred yards away, Custer, four lengths ahead of his troops, kicked his mount into a gallop and shouted, Come on, you Wolverines, which was the nickname of the Michigan, uh, Michigan brigades. And the blue line surged forward and what many called the most gallant charge of the war. And 2,400 Union cavalrymen, led by George Armstrong Custer, in the front, which the troops were just screaming and yelling wildly that they hear the general leading them into battle. They couldn't believe it. And they hit smack dab right into the Union, into the Confederate cavalry that was coming at them with people like Wade Hampton were in the, in the, in the front and, and others. And, uh, and it, they clashed together. They said it would sound like falling timber when they hit. And, and the fighting was so intense and, and close quarters. They, they found pairs of blue and gray men pinned to each other by tightly clenched sabers driven through their bodies. And the area around Rummel's farm, which is the, the pasture that they had to go through in this, was just littered with horses and uh, the place, it was just unbelievable. The, the carnage that went on, uh, Custer got thrown off his horse and got on another horse and, and continued to lead and they kept fighting and, and, uh, he had troops in the rear who couldn't stand it. So <laughs> they came rushing out too to go up and hit the rebels and, uh, and Custer pushed them all the way back up Crest Ridge and then called a pullback of, the, of his troops once Stewart had them up on Crest Ridge. And Custer waited down there with his men to see if Stewart was bluffing or if he was going to try and come again. Well, he tried to come again. Custer pushed them back again. And it was, was totally outnumbered the way he was. And... Nobody thinks much of what, what, why, why was this happening? Did Stewart want to wipe out Custer and Greg's troops down there? No. And I'll tell you what the problem is. <laughs> Nobody wanted to read Jeb Stewart's report that Lee destroyed the reports of himself and Longstreet and Pickett, uh, after the war. There's a, there's a 126 volume set called uh, the official records of the war where you have all of these after battle reports that all the generals on both sides wrote i mean everything from you know draining the the oil out of the tuna fish every thousand miles to 
what happened at Gettysburg, except the ones for Gettysburg are missing, except for Jeff Stewart. And, and nobody has questioned, well, what was Jeff Stewart doing? And, and what was Lee doing? Lee, Lee sent 13,000 men streaming down across this pasture to a suicide mission? That's something Grant would do, which he did, like at Cold Harbor, for example. And, and, and everybody wondered, what, why, would, why did this happen? And uh, nobody read Stewart's report, I guess, except me, 14th. 1,300 <laughs> words where it reads like a, like a novel in a way, but he kept saying in there he had to get to the Union rear. He was supposed to hit the Union rear the same time Pickett was coming to the Union front, and so they would have to have men that would face to the, to the rear, and it would soften their lines, and it could work. Because I always wonder, why would Lee... Do something stupid like that, you know, and, and he didn't. He had a brilliant strategy. The only trouble was Jeb Stewart couldn't make it to the Union rear because he ran into General George Armstrong Custer, 23 years old, three days a general, and Custer beat the And he wanted to prove himself the at in, in battle in this war. morning. So here you have Gettysburg, the turning point of the war. Hey, why doesn't Custer get a little credit? They never even mention in these documentaries that there was a battle east of Gettysburg on the Hanover Road. Crest Ridge, Jeb Stewart. Why, why did Jeb Stewart's Invincibles have a thousand infantrymen with them that Lee sent? Well, it's because the infantrymen were, you know, there to hit the Union rear along with the cavalrymen, with Stewart's cavalrymen. But Custer never gets credit for this. There's the big mystery of the Civil War and Gettysburg, because that was a turning point. And then well, Custer went on to the most unbelievable victories. He had one major defeat at Trevilian Station, which he uh, made up for later on. He almost was surrounded by his good friend from West Point, his best friend, Tom Rosser of Texas, Confederate general. He later beat Rosser. And uh, Rosser was a uh, chief engineer of the Union Pacific Railroad years later, and he went on the Yellowstone expedition that Custer commanded. And they had a great time sitting around the campfire talking about winning and losing in the Civil War. But anyway, Custer uh, became a major hero. They picked him up on that, and they Harper's Weekly had pictures of a Custer leading charges and he, he became the biggest hero. He was able to win the heart of the prettiest girl in Monroe, Michigan, Libby Bacon. Her father, Judge Bacon, had refused to allow her to have anything to do with him when he was a lowly lieutenant. Then suddenly he's a, he's a general and, and getting all these headlines nationally. He wore a red tie so his troops could see him on the field. And so they, they started wearing red ties. So he was he was absolutely loved by his men. They they just adored him. They could not believe that this general was right there with them fighting. And if he could go in, they had the guts to go in. So that's a story that just isn't told. And why not? I don't mm -hmm. understand it. I, I watched the documentary not too long ago on the History Channel about that. And they said, well... Well, Pickett's men, they just, they just dissipated. They, they didn't have the guts to, to charge anymore. They, well, yeah, okay. They didn't because they were getting hammered because Jeb Stewart did not make it to the Union rear. Where if you had 6,000 men attacking the rear, that would be possibly a turning point. And Lee could have won the battle. Maybe if Greg would have been uh, commanding those troops instead of Custer, Stewart would have broken through. You never know. Yeah. So Custer doesn't get any credit for that whatsoever. <laughs> it's, well, you know, it just how, amazed me. How how did the other generals uh, and feel about him? Because he was so young, first of all, and then he would do things like uh, lead that battle as a general rather than stay in the rear. Um, weren't, weren't they kind of being, um, you know, I don't know, up, up shown by him? Didn't they feel like they were had to uh, do something about him, or did they like him, or how did that go? Well, they kind of 
kept to themselves in, in a sense. He did have a rivalry. He did have a rivalry with uh, General Merritt, who was uh, promoted the same day he was to general. In later years, when they held uh, a hearing to see if uh, what what happened to Little Bighorn, if if Colonel Reno or Major, as he was then, Major Reno was a coward and disobeyed orders. This Merritt was uh, was the presiding officer at that hearing, and he slanted the whole thing. Years later, the recorder, at, who was a lieutenant at the time, became a general, and he contacted Custer's wife, his widow, and said, if I'd have known at the time about General Merritt's hate for your husband, I would have done something about it and changed the whole story so that it wouldn't be that they, you know, exonerated Reno. Uh, and it, Custer was was uh, actually respected by these people because they wanted to win the war. And the more battles you won, the uh, I mean, Sheridan, for example, took Custer under his wing. Custer was under Sheridan and and was his mentor all through life, as a matter of fact. And, uh, I mean, he Sheridan became famous and became known because of Custer when they rode down the Shenandoah together and right to Appomattox, where Custer, one battle after another, he, he was a victor, victor and made Sheridan look mighty good because Sheridan... Uh, the, the cavalry was used to guard the artillery for the most part. And mm -hmm. Sheridan went to Grant, or he went, he went to some other generals, and he said, you know, if you cut me loose, I can go and destroy the Confederate Army. But I'm, I'm sick of sitting in the rear with the artillery. Cut me loose. And they went and told Grant that and said, well, should we bring him up on charges of insubordination? And Grant said, no, cut him loose. Let him go. So, with Custer in the lead, he went down the Shenandoah Valley and uh, right to Appomattox. And it, in one battle of Winchester, for example, the troops were highly Custer's troops were highly outnumbered. I mean, it was a it was ridiculous. Uh, and uh, Sheridan told him to hit the left flank of the Confederate line. And Custer came back and said, well, if you don't mind, that's a suicide charge. If you let me decide the time and the place to hit, we'll be okay. And if any other general had said that, they would have been brought up on insubordination charges and pulled right off the line immediately. But Sheridan agreed. Custer charged and came back with 700 prisoners, where he was totally outnumbered. And so things like this. Then he went to, uh, he knocked off supply trains at Appomattox, which basically ended the war. He was sitting there when General Lee's man came in to the lines with the white flag and said, uh, we surrender. And Custer said, well, I can't accept your flag, but I will get you to the people who can. And the next day, Custer was there at Wilmer McLean's house, which was in Appomattox, where Lee and Grant sat down and signed the uh, surrender, unconditional mm -hmm. surrender by the South. And uh, Custer was out on the porch renewing friendships with his Southern friends. And then uh, Sheridan was so impressed with Custer. He paid $20 for the table, the writing table, that the official papers were signed on, and he gave it to Custer and wrote a note that's, that uh, words to the effect, uh, giving it to Custer's wife, Libby, saying that I can't think of anyone, an individual in our service, who's contributed more to bringing about this result than your husband. And so Custer rode off with that table on his head, <laughs> and uh, it's now in the Smithsonian Institute. But Started to say they, they, they had to. Uh, I was also going to ask about the other, uh, you know, the other people 
uh, like sergeants and captains and stuff that he leapfrogged over in their in his promotion. Did it did it cause him a distance with a lot of the people he fought with? Well, at first they resented it, and Captain Kidd uh, wrote a book on that, A Cavalryman with Custer, which has been put out every every year. It's issued in a new version, and uh, and he said these people were so jealous and envious it was unbelievable. But as I say, Custer proved himself, and that's what it mattered. He started out with a, with uh, the Michigan Brigade and. He became a division commander and uh, was dependent on, and they said, oh, well, Custer had high casualties or he killed a lot of horses and all this. Well, part of it was because Custer was the lead battalion always. Custer was in the front. Custer was trusted to go and get the job done, just like at Little Bighorn. He was trusted to do his job, and that's what he did, his job as a military man. And so... Nobody could dislike him for that. He he did come out of there with a lot of people who did dislike him for one reason or another, and that carried over into the Seventh Cavalry. Uh, but the Seventh Cavalry again. Uh, this was the post-war when the good soldiers went home, and the, and the bad soldiers stayed in the military. Or like Custer, they knew they were just military men, and so they stayed there. But. Yeah, he had he had some people who resented it, but I mean there would be ceremonies at the White House, and Libby Custer would be invited to go into the Oval Office with with President Lincoln, and and an adjutant would be there, and he'd have thirty uh, flags from the Confederacy that he would present to Lincoln, and each one captured by General Custer. Captured by General Custer. Captured by General Custer. And Libby was just, boy, if I could vote, I'd vote for you, President Lincoln. <laughs> but women couldn't vote then. Yeah. And what happened to Jeb Stewart? Jeb Stewart, whom I, I must say I have a lot of respect for. I, I, I can say my interest in the Civil War comes personally because my people did fight for the Union. Cyrus Hatch at Fredericksburg was killed. That was one of my relatives. His brother... Daniel Webster Hatch was shot through the head and lost an eye, but he lived. He was in the hospital for for uh, over a year. I had another relative, Salon Hatch, who rode with Custer down the, the Shenandoah with the Pennsylvania Cavalry. And so I, I do have a vested interest in this, but I, again, I lived in in Memphis, Tennessee, for several years, I got to know a lot of people, and and I don't like the dehumanizing of the Southerners. I I can't say anything about slavery or any of these terrible institution, obviously, and and there's a whole lot to debate on on various things, but but it it, it does bother me in 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 a sense of of some of the treatment. But Jeb Stewart was revered down south and. He uh, went to a little area called Yellow Tavern outside of of Richmond, Virginia, and set up battle lines, and Custer happened along, and Custer led the charge that killed Jeb Stewart. And that, that kind of took the heart out of the uh, cavalry uh, for the Confederacy after that. Stewart uh, was the, the heart and soul of the cavalry, and Lee split the cavalry up between Generals Wade Hampton and his nephew Fitzhugh Lee, and that just really didn't work. Uh, they needed Jeb Stewart, and uh, supposedly Lee wept over that, that, that Stewart had been killed. And uh, I, I write in, in one of my books, uh, The Death of Stewart, and, and it's, a, it's a very sad situation. He was somewhat of a decent man. He didn't really believe in slavery, when he got married, his mother offered to give him him and his wife a slave, and he said, "No thanks, we're we're not into that." So, uh, I Custer again brought about the demise of the greatest cavalry leader for the South. Some debate, you know, of whether Stewart was the greatest, but I, I think he 
he certainly is head and shoulders above anybody else. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. but I, you know, I, I, go ahead. I was just going to say, was he able to have kids before he was killed, uh, Custer? No, he didn't. They didn't have children, and um, and no one knows why. Uh, but he might have had some illness or something. I don't know if it was him or his wife, but they did not have kids. And it's kind of funny because well, one of the uh, one of his detractors with the Seventh Cavalry claimed that he fathered a child with a uh, Cheyenne woman when they captured a Cheyenne woman at uh, at Washita that he fathered a child, which is absurd because she had the child six months after Washita. So, you know, if you do the math, <laughs> it doesn't quite work <laughs> out. But that's another myth that you will hear about Custer. Is that yeah, you, he really wasn't around Custer, for it. <laughs> there's, there's things about Custer that you just, I couldn't believe when I heard them. And, and just, just one thing after another, he was a very decent man. He didn't drink, didn't smoke. Tried to control his swearing because he said, you know, just there's sometimes you just can't find the right words. But Custer was actually uh, a born again Christian, which I had a letter that he wrote to a minister at the Presbyterian Church in Monroe, Michigan, saying, when I go out in battle, uh, I, I pray the night before and I don't worry about it. Whatever happens is God's will, and and. He uh, he professed to being a Christian, uh, which is very surprising. Again, and he got beat up for many uh, things. That one they haven't really gotten onto yet, but they don't really publicize it. It's in my book, Glorious War, uh, where I, I I even have a portion of the letter that I I produce in there. But um, he he had about. In 1861, when he came home to Monroe, Michigan, where he and the other guy went out drinking, and they staggered past the home of Judge Bacon and Lift Bacon, who would become his, his bride, and the judge always remembered that, that he, he was boisterous and loud, and he and another guy yelling and singing, going down the street drunk, going home. Well, he was living with his older sister at the time, half-sister, and she took him into the bedroom with the Bible and gave him the mother of all temperance lectures, and he never again drank in his life, not even wine at special occasions. He let the men drink. He had the sutler. He let them drink. He didn't tolerate the drunkenness, but that was a uh, something that plagued the frontier army as it was, drunkenness. Yeah. But that's another thing people don't know about Custer and, of course, wouldn't. These days, he would be mocked for that, I'm sure. So, well, yeah, he, it <laughs> depends on the community. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, not necessarily. Yeah, and, and even back then, wasn't that kind of, you know, the road that somebody that saw themselves as a general officer isn't that the kind of the road that they took? You know, they wanted to be chivalrous. You know, they wanted to be honorable. Uh, well, anyway, we're we're actually getting close to the end of the show, and uh, oh no. <laughs> yeah, I know it always goes so fast. I, I, but I, I really appreciate you being here. Again, we've had the award-winning author and historian, Tom Hatch, and we've been talking about the Glorious War and uh, General Custer. Um, thank you for taking the time to come on the show. Well, I, I enjoyed it. I, I, I enjoy talking about Custer because there are so many myths, and I'm sure people will call me on this and say, oh, that couldn't <laughs> happen. But, hey, before you do that, do your research, okay? Yeah, <laughs> I always. did the research, and yeah. and that that bothers me that you know people don't do the research anymore. They they start public just publishing myth after myth, legend after legend. I went yeah. in and looked at all of that stuff, and and that's what I encourage people to do when when they're dealing with history is don't take this for a fact. Look it up yourself. Do some independent research and. I was shocked to hear that a lot of colleges now, the professors are giving them a list that they're allowed to use as sources where they can't do independent research. That is terrible. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, Not good. But I, I appreciate you having me again. you you got a great show. And uh, uh, 
hopefully I added some good to it today. Oh, always. And we'll do it again. To find out... To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.